Hi, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Yannick Garayeb, and I'm the Senior Health Information Specialist with Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, and so pleased to be online with you today. Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada really strives to provide relevant and up-to-date information on brain tumors. And three years ago, we launched the National Brain Tumor Conference in Toronto. And after evaluating the impact of the first three conferences, we found that live streaming had a really big impact on our brain tumor community, um, having reached over 1,800 people through live streaming in those three years. So with that in mind, we have created this webinar series, and we're really excited to have Dr. Peets with us, uh, online with us today. And so in lieu of our national conference in English in Toronto, um, both from an impact perspective and a financial perspective, we are launching this series this year, and this is the first of the series. And really excited that we have uh, over 101 people who registered for the webinar today, so thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Um, and we are recording this uh, presentation. It will be uploaded to our website within about a week or so. And so before we get started, I just have a few logistics. Everyone has been muted, uh, so we don't have background noise during the recording of the webinar. And if you are having difficulties hearing us, please make sure that your sound is up on your computer. Or if you have any difficulties in, in, in general, you can chat um, with me through the chat section on the GoToWebinar panel. Or if you have a question, you can pose a question there. And um, I will be taking up all questions at the end of the webinar and will verbally uh, give them to Dr. Peets. And if we don't get to all of them, we will follow up via email directly with you. Directly at the end of the webinar as well, a very short survey, five questions will pop up on the screen. If you don't have time to do it, uh, it does only take one minute, but if you don't have time to do it, you will also receive an email. We'd love to get feedback on the webinar. And before I introduce uh, Dr. Peets, I have two very quick poll questions we want to ask the audience. So you should see in a second um, a poll here that pops up. If you can choose, um, all that apply to you. So who is currently online with us for this webinar today? Are you a patient and survivor, caregiver, family member or friend, a healthcare professional, or a Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada volunteer? And if you're more than one, feel free to uh, click that. I'll give you a second to add your answers. Great. People are still voting. Okay, so we'll close that poll. And um, we'll see that we have 38% uh, Dr. Peets are patient and survivors, 38% are caregivers, 38% are family members, 14% are healthcare professionals, and 17% are volunteers. That's great. And so one more question for the audience is how did you hear about the webinar series? So did you hear it through a, a communication through Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, through social media, through a family or friend? Uh, you found it online through our website or you were referred by a healthcare professional. So give everybody a moment to choose one of those answers, please. Looks like the majority of you heard about it through our communication, through email or newsletters or posters, so that's great. Give you one more second to vote. Looks like everybody slowed down, okay. Here we go, 77% uh, through uh, BTFC communication, so that's great. Thank you for doing that, everybody. Really appreciate it. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, Dr. Peets is the medical oncologist who treats patients with brain tumors and breast cancer at Cancer Care Manitoba. He is also the head of clinical research and chief medical information officer at Cancer Care Manitoba as well. Dr. Peets is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Manitoba and is involved in multiple research teams and recently led the first successful team grant from Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation looking at pseudoprogression and glioblastoma. Today, Dr. Peets' presentation is entitled, Is the Chemo Working? This seemingly simple question is more complex than it should be for patients with a brain tumor. MRI is the most sensitive way of answering that question, but often the results are ambiguous or misleading. While it is usually a good sign if the tumor looks smaller on the MRI, sometimes an enlarging tumor can be either a sign that the cancer is growing or responding to treatment. Dr. Peets will discuss through these phenomena in the setting of brain tumors and their treatment, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Peets. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be, uh, to be speaking. I just wanted to thank the Brain Tumor Foundation for putting this on. I think it's a really great initiative. So. Um, with that, I 
I will start, just bear with me. There we go. So those are my official titles and affiliations. Um, I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this topic. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time first outlining, uh, most of the talk will be around um, this concept of pseudoprogression for uh, patients with glioblastoma. Um, as you'll see, um, it's starting to be described in uh, in other settings as well, not just patients with glioblastoma. So I will get into that a little bit as well. I think uh, at the end of this, um, you'll have an idea of what we use to assess response in neuro-oncology and, um, and then also be able to have an understanding of the concept of pseudoprogression, why it's important, and um, know a little bit about what we do to try to determine uh, true progression from pseudoprogression. Um, happy to answer questions, so hopefully, uh, hopefully this is um, of interest. So, um, as you know, um, the, uh, the way that we look at a uh, brain tumor is based on what it looks like under the microscope, um, how aggressive it looks, and um, certain features of it. And so what you can see on this slide is the uh, now older classification that was based just on um, microscopy, where glioblastoma would be the grade four astrocytoma bottom right corner. Um, but there was also the possibility of being a mixed oligoastrocytoma or a pure oligodendroglioma, um, as you can see. And so those, uh, those were the typical um, uh, types of brain tumors um, that we would see and treat. And um, in 2016, they changed that um, to be more based on molecular markers. So you'll see this slide is fairly complex, but um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the major determinants is whether the patient's tumor is um, mutant, uh, meaning that it's got a change in the genetic code for the IDH, um, the IDH gene um, or not. And uh, those that do have a mutation in this IDH gene uh, tend to do better and tend to have a different disease. And um, then they also look for other alterations, this 1P19Q codeletion being um, characteristic of oligodendroglioma and lack of that codeletion um, being consistent with astrocytoma. Um, glioblastoma is kind of on the far right here, and but is still broken up. And so there's still a very uh, important prognostic significance to that IDH gene again. And, uh, and so now this has become the standard as to how we classify brain tumors. Glioblastoma is, as, uh, as you probably know, the most common brain tumor, the most common primary brain tumor, and it's certainly the most aggressive primary brain tumor. And um, I'll spend just a few minutes on how we approach its treatment. Um, because it's relevant for the topic. So um, usually um, patients will be evaluated uh, by a surgeon and have as much of the tumor taken out as is safely possible based on its location, based on how the patient is doing um, and a host of other factors. And um, they do that with the intent of trying to not cause or, um, or uh, further impair someone because patients often do have a difficulty that's brought them in. After that, um, they will the patients will go for chemotherapy and radiation combined treatment for six weeks, and then there's usually a break of about a month or so, and then they will get uh, usually offered chemotherapy for uh, for another six to twelve months, um, monthly cycles of chemotherapy. And as you probably know, usually we're talking about temozolomide and temozolomide is the chemotherapy given during radiation and on a five-day schedule uh, every month after radiation. This is the original publication actually that changed practice um, and it's dated 2005, not sure you can make that out, um, but uh, was, was published um, now almost 15 years ago, 14 years ago, I guess, um, and it shows a pretty uh, considerable benefit. Um, the patients in the blue line um, had a better chance of being alive at any given time 
compared to the patients in the red line. So if they got radiation plus chemotherapy, um, they did better. And so that's that has become the standard. Um, you know, what are the goals of trying to of trying to improve outcomes is is trying to make that blue line as high as possible. And that's uh, that's been one of the bigger challenges. Um, and it's unfortunate that we don't have something that's dramatically better uh, now so many years later. But this forms the basis of the standard treatment in most places in the world. There was a um, Canadian trial um, in patients who were a bit older um, that also uh, basically looked at the same thing, just a shorter duration of radiation and uh, found essentially the same benefit of temozolomide with radiation. And, uh, and so that complements the, the other study that I just showed you um, in, that, um, in that there was some question as to whether patients who were over 65 benefited from this approach, and it turns out they do. So um, this is how we typically will approach patients as a standard therapy unless a clinical trial is available. And that's, that should be true most places in Canada. So I want to back up a little bit and just say, um, you know, patients will often um, see something very different than their doctors will, um, and certainly families see that too. And so um, it usually starts off with something scary and something that there, you know, comes on unexpectedly, be that weakness or seizure or some change in their speech, something that um, that obviously is wrong. And they, you know, go to an emergency room typically and get investigated. Um, and then they're told what it looks like and say, you need to see a surgeon. They go undergo the surgery and then have these discussions um, just a few weeks after that about now having radiation and chemotherapy um, and uh, trying to come to terms with what they're dealing with. And so I hope that as they go through that, they develop a sense of trust um, with the team that's around them. Um, and, and they get followed by the, uh, usually the, uh, the um, medical oncologist or neuro-oncologist through the chemotherapy. And they get an MRI, uh, you know, every two to three months. And, um, and then the question, the natural question is, did it work? You know, I've gone through all of this treatment, this very intense treatment, and did it work? And that's really the focus of what we want to talk about today, because it seems like uh, a very simple question. Um, you know, is it bigger? Is it smaller? Um, is it working or not? Um, what does it mean for me? And uh, sometimes uh, the oncologist has uh, the information that they need, and sometimes they don't. And, um, and so I wanted to shed some light on that uncertainty. So this is a picture of, uh, of a patient's brain. Um, you're looking from their feet. Um, so I don't know if you can see my arrow, uh, hopefully. Um, so this is the forehead is at the top, the back of the head is at the bottom. And so you're looking from their feet. So this is the right side and this is the left side. And uh, so what we typically do, we look for differences from the left to the right. And you can see this big white dot here. Um, and so that is a representation of the tumor um, that has lit up. This is, uh, this is you can see the, these streaks of, of white here. Those are blood vessels that have the, the gadolinium that's, that's given at the time of the MRI. And so this is essentially lit up with that, um, with that intravenous contrast. And so that's what would be essentially, you know, after the biopsy or after surgery, you know, a location like this, not much surgery would be possible. And so you get a biopsy typically saying that this is glioblastoma, and then the patient goes and gets chemotherapy and radiation together, and they come back uh, usually, say, three or four weeks after the radiation is complete with another MRI, and this is what they see, or this is what the radiologist and the and the doctor see, and um, it may be a little bit hard to appreciate over the webinar, but um, this is quite a bit bigger uh, now after chemotherapy and radiation than it was initially, and so that's hard to explain. Um, it's either that the tumor's growing, 
or that something has happened to make the tumor look bigger. And it's differentiating those two that is actually very challenging at times. Normally what we would do is plan to go on to the standard next step, which is five-day temozolomide. And, uh, and so that's what happened in this case. And so they get this MRI three months later and it's much smaller. And so you've continued on the same treatment or it's the same treatment plan and yet the tumor gets smaller. Um, suggests that this reaction here um, wasn't the tumor growing. Um, because if you if you have a tumor that's resistant to temozolomide and you just give it more temozolomide, it's not likely to get smaller. And I know there's some subtle differences with how we give temozolomide at different doses and schedules that can actually make a difference. But by and large, um, continuing on the same therapy, you don't expect it to just shrink on its own. So that is what we would call pseudoprogression. And it doesn't have to be just af right after chemo radiation. Sometimes it's actually at the two or three month mark where we'll see the increased size. And so it might be smaller, you know, after the chemotherapy and radiation component and then get larger two to three months later. And then at the six month time is when you find that uh, it's gotten smaller again and that it's actually being pseudo progression all along. I'll just spend a couple of minutes on uh, response assessment. So um, for, we'll say, 20-some years, we had um, the so-called McDonald criteria. Dr. McDonald and Dr. Karen Cross were in London at the time, uh, London, Ontario. Um, they uh, basically came up with these criteria for how we would assess whether someone uh, uh, with a brain tumors, uh, we, you know, was getting better or getting worse um, or no change. And so you can see it's based on the size of the uh, mass, the largest cross section in this case. It's based on how the patient was doing their neurological exam. And it's based on whether they were needing steroids, dexamethasone, uh, whether they, those were going up or down. But that was based mostly on CT criteria at the time. And now we have an MRI. And there's, there are now new criteria that we use, um, the so-called RANO criteria, response assessment in neuro-oncology. And I don't want to belabor it, but these essentially now use MRI as the, as the standard uh, of, uh, choice, or sort of the imaging of choice. And um, it's very similar um, to what the McDonald criteria were. Um, some of the differences, um, include that you know MRI is able to look at a couple of things differently than CT scan. So the T1 with GD is gadolinium or the T2 or flare scan just gives you a little bit more information. And they also account for um, pseudo progression. So I'm not sure if it's cut off on your screens, but at the bottom there's a little asterisk that says PD, progressive disease within three months is considered pseudo progression unless it's outside the radiation field or histologically proven, meaning uh, um, surgically resected and looked at under the microscope. So they tried to acknowledge that within three months, progression of disease is not something that you can necessarily uh, determine um, without further follow-up. I probably should have said at the outset, this CR is complete response, PR is partial response, SD is stable disease and PD is progressive disease. So you can see someone who's got an uh, increase in the size of their enhancement or a size increase in the size of their flare or they're worse neurologically, they've got more weakness, uh, for example, or they're on more steroids. Um, that's considered progression under the RANO criteria. So then what is pseudoprogression? It really is a transient increase in contrast enhancement, in particular contrast enhancement, within the first six months following treatment. And um, its highest rate is within the first three months uh, from chemotherapy and radiation combined. And uh, we know now that it doesn't always have to have chemotherapy. In fact, originally it was described without chemotherapy. Um, 
It doesn't always have to have radiation therapy preceding it, and it doesn't always have to be temozolomide. But historically and classically, that's how it's described. On MRI, it's indistinguishable from disease progression. And in fact, using anything else, it's sometimes indistinguishable. It's not very difficult to, excuse me, to determine. It can occur quite frequently, and we say up to a quarter of patients or a third of patients can have pseudoprogression. And we assume that it is actually just what happens to an MRI when there are immune changes or an immune reaction, a tissue reaction, or some other blood-brain barrier disruption that occurs uh, after the treatment. So here's another example. Again, the same orientation as before. This is one patient. This is the type of scan you would get after gadolinium, um, so the post-contrast scan. And the bottom um, is uh, what's called a flare scan or T2 scan, giving you uh, a sense of either um, the less aggressive parts of the tumor or the swelling around the tumor. And so what you can see is immediately post-op, there really is a, you know, a tiny bit of a line here of contrast enhancement, but really nothing else and a bit of flare change. And so that flare change gives you what's probably a better idea of the extent of the tumor. And then after, two months after chemo radiation, it's this massive um, area that's now enhancing and um, a smaller, sorry, a much, and also a larger area of flare that is, uh, that is, um, has uh, come on. And then if you follow it another month, it gets smaller on its own. And so this patient didn't have any change in their treatment. And this uh, contrast enhancement is smaller, as you can see. And the flare change may be a little bit hard to appreciate there, but it's unchanged. It's not continuing to grow, maybe a bit better. And so that's the one I showed you before, but the same idea where it was smaller, got bigger after treatment, and then um, uh, smaller again with the con continuing on the same treatment. So it, the uh, original description um, was from 1979. Um, and all these patients, I, so I should clarify, all these patients were actually had chemotherapy and radiation, not temozolomide back then. Um, but they, this is where we get some of those initial numbers. Um, half the patients had some change in their disease that was consistent with progression. Um, and half of those that had that change were either real progression or pseudoprogression because um, some of the patients improved without a change in therapy and some of the patients did not. And this TTP is time to progression. So in this paper, they tried to suggest uh, that patients with pseudoprogression actually can do better, have a better overall outcome. And I think that question still remains, um, to be honest with you. I'm not sure anyone knows the answer to that, um, but that was what was postulated by their observations. And they had the same kind of um, discussion around what they thought was the cause. Um, I won't really focus too much on that and on this, but just to say that um, some of those molecular markers that I talked about can have, a, have an impact. So we know that um, you're a bit more likely to get pseudoprogression if you're MGMT methylated, for example. Um, but this is a recent study and did not show a difference between those uh, who had pseudoprogression and uh, those who did not. This is also something that's being described more and more in other uh, tumor types. And so um, not, just, uh, not just in the brain. So it's been described for decades with something called the tamoxifen flare, where you give someone with breast cancer tamoxifen and some of the disease that you couldn't see before is now visible or um, the disease you could see is now uh, substantially worse, at least on imaging, and sometimes actually can feel worse. But it is a response to the treatment itself. Um, and we've noticed it a lot more with some of the newer immuno-oncology drugs, checkpoint inhibitors and things that are used for melanoma, uh, kidney cancer, and lung cancer. And um, so these scans are of the liver, but it's meant to show that you can see uh, changes that occur 
that are not due to the uh, tumor getting worse, but are what presumably is an immune reaction. And so there's even reports of this immune reaction in patients getting immunotherapy for brain tumors. This is, an, this is a patient on study. This is not a standard approach, but they did show um, how you start someone on a checkpoint inhibitor and that mass gets bigger and then smaller over the course of many months. Uh, maybe let's skip over that. Okay. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time then talking about how we approach it because um, at least in my experience, it's pretty, it's pretty disconcerting for the oncologist to go in the room and say, uh, you know, this is a little bit bigger um, and it's possible that that's the tumor getting worse, but it's also possible that it's a reaction and nothing to worry about. Um, and not being able to give any confidence either way, to be honest with you, um, I think is obviously pretty, it would be distressing for me as a patient. So um, what I had showed you before, this is the, is the same, this is the second example I gave you before. Um, this is conventional MRI. And so we use that all the time. That's what's available in almost every center. And you would have um, these so-called flare scans and the so-called T T1 gadolinium scans, post-contrast scans. And that gives you most of what you need um, when you're assessing these and certainly gives you the size um, and uh, gives you a, 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 at least an idea of the extent. Um, but there's more information that you could get from an MRI. And there are lots of new, um, not so new to be honest with you, but there are, there are lots of different, we'll say, techniques that can be done with an MRI or with other types of tests to give you a bit more information. So MRI uh, perfusion can be done one of a few ways, but essentially allows you to get a sense of the blood flow through whatever you're imaging. So in this case, the brain. And what I wanted to point out was that this is what it looks like on a contrast scan and this is what it would look like on a perfusion scan. And so you can see that this area that's bright white here is also really bright here, suggesting that there's a lot of blood flow there that you might uh, expect would go along with a tumor growing and requiring blood. In an area that is pseudoprogression, you would not expect that. You would expect um, you might not expect that, I should say. This is why that's not a perfect test either. But you might expect that there's less blood flow. Dr. Peep, are the you there? Because oh. there is actually oh, you... dead. It's had some. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Yeah. Peep, the genic. Sorry, you, you, were, you were cutting out there for a second, but I think it's okay now. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so suffice to say that this, this uh, MRI, uh, this perfusion MRI can give you more information um, and is at least able to provide the radiologist with a little bit more information when they're trying to determine true progression from pseudo progression. Um, but I think it's not available very many places and is also not, um, there's not really a standard protocol or a standard uh, way to read them. And so it requires a lot of um, expertise and processing, and it's not always available. Um, I'm gonna go over that. Let's just skip over these. This is just this is um, some of the data that's looked at whether this is helpful. This MR perfusion, and it does seem to have a, a you know very good um, ability to to show um, pseudo progression versus not, but it's very dependent, as I mentioned, on the local centers. Um, uh, expertise and uh, and support that they have. Another example is something called MR spectroscopy, so magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And so this is also fairly specialized. It's it's a it's it's fairly available. Um, and um, what it is is essentially um, you, they do an MRI and they hone in on just a small little square here. So you can see maybe where I'm pointing on the screen. It's just one little spot. And that one little spot 
um, allows them to be more um, detailed in their analysis. And so what they're looking for is what chemical composition is uh, made up uh, within that, that square, or it's actually a cube. So what they call it a voxel. Um, and they can see what it's made up of. And they look at certain peaks. They'll look at, um, so these, this is the concentration of various chemicals within that part of the brain. And some of them help to determine whether that's a tumor growing or a tumor dying. Um, and so they can see, uh, you know, choline is the CHO peak, for example. Creatine is this peak. NAA is this, uh, is this neuronal marker. And lactate is a measure of dying tissue. So when there's a high, um, you know, choline to creatinine ratio or in a low um, NAA it tells the radiologist something about what they're looking at. So an example would be, um, would be, this is combining all three modalities now. So A, the panel A here looks at what is a one centimeter um, contrast enhancing lesion. You can see in the perfusion scan, there's an area here where there's more blood flow than the surrounding, just immediately surrounding tissue, suggesting that it's um, uh, using a fair bit of blood. I should say that the, you know, you expect that the brain uses a lot of blood. And so this areas that I'm showing you around the outside of the brain are all expected because that's what's required for consciousness and for whatever the patient's doing. So it's really only helpful in areas where you don't expect a high blood flow. Um, panels C and D then give you measurements of the chemical composition. So one is uh, over top of that area that that we're looking at, this one centimeter lesion, and D is a panel on the other side of the brain where there is no lesion on the, the on the uh, on the conventional MRI, and you presume that that is closer to normal. And you can see that the chemical structures of these uh, or at least you might be able to see um, the chemical structure is different. So the choline peak on the right side where we think, uh, you know, overlies this area is much higher. It's actually cut off here, um, but it's, it's it would be way up here if they hadn't cut it off. Um, and so that, that ratio of choline to creatinine is much higher compared to the normal side. And the neuronal marker, NAA, is lower. So that measures 38.9 and this on the other side measures 69.4, suggesting that there's not as much uh, normal brain tissue there, and there's a lot of membrane turnover. And you can measure a lactate peak, I'm not the best at this, but it looks like that number's higher, suggesting that it's, uh, that it's um, tumor tissue. And people have looked at other things, other types of MRI that would give you even more information to look at, uh, to look at these. But the truth is these are all really still experimental and nobody knows uh, the best way to use MRI to determine these things. I mentioned earlier that the, the gold standard way to figure this out is, um, is considered getting a sample. So sending the patient for another surgery, getting the tissue looked at under the microscope and the, the pathologist should be able to tell you um, unfortunately, that's not always the case either. So in my experience, and uh, so these, the, I should say first, you know, these are some of the classic pathological changes that you might see in um, pseudoprogression where it's a reactive response as opposed to lots of tumor growing. If it was tumor, you'd see this panel B here as a measure of proliferation. You'd see lots of these little cells here, uh, these dark ones. For example, um, unfortunately, what they will often see is some proliferation and some treatment change. And they, it's hard for a pathologist to be definitive to tell you, yes, it's pseudoprogression or yes, it's tumor. Sometimes it's obvious, but there are often cases where it's in the middle. And probably this means that it's not necessary uh, necessarily the case that it's always pseudoprogression or completely pseudoprogression or that it's completely progression of disease i imagine that there's a mixture and that's why we're 
we have difficulty sorting out um, whether someone has pseudoprogression or not because they might have a bit of pseudoprogression and a bit of progression. And it's just uh, not something that we can, we can actually tell the difference based on our current tools. This is basically what I mentioned, where you can tell if it's clearly viable or aggressive tumor or treatment changes, but there's no reliable marker even under the microscope to look for. And most of these cases have mixed changes. And so you don't always get the information you need to inform treatment, uh, to form treatment decisions. Um, I'll spend just a, a couple of minutes saying that um, there is this thing called atypical pseudoprogression that I and others have described in, um, in patients that did not get temozolomide um, and not even always got radiation. And so we actually found an example here of a patient with an oligodendroglioma who got uh, treatment with something called PCV, which is multiple different chemotherapies um, and, uh, and uh, useful for that disease, oligodendroglioma. And um, you can see, you know, that at their baseline, this is the tumor that we were looking at. Um, I should say this is a different orientation, I suppose. So in this case, this is the top of the head. This is the neck. And this is kind of towards the back of the brain. This part is called the cerebellum patient would be looking at you in this case. So again, this is the right side and the left side. And so this is the location of the tumor here. You can see it's dark around it. That's the swelling around it. And then um, at the next scan, a few months later, it's bigger. The area that's got contrast enhancement is bigger, but also all of the dark area, the swelling is much bigger around it as well. And then continuing on treatment, um, the same treatment, it gets smaller over time. And uh, that's characteristic of, um, of uh, pseudoprogression. So how do we approach this problem? Um, you know, mostly, I think most of us try to approach it as honestly as possible and describe what we see to the patient. Um, but when we're trying to help with decision-making, Usually if the patient is doing well and is asymptomatic from the change and there's not really any imminent risk, we will try to give the benefit of the doubt and continue the present treatment, whatever that is. So usually temozolomide and then repeat imaging in another couple of months, two to three months, depending on what it looks like and its size, et cetera, um, with those additional tests if they're available in that center. And that's usually what we'll try to do. If they are at imminent risk, there's growth that's worrisome because there's too much, there's going to be too much pressure um, or um, it's growing into an area where they're going to have lots of symptoms in the short term, then we will often switch therapy or even consider surgery again um, to, try to, uh, to try to buy some time. And if they're symptomatic, uh, then uh, the choice is, uh, harder to stick with the same therapy because they are obviously having some problem. And we assume that uh, that when patients are symptomatic that we have to do something differently. Uh, I say assume because we don't know. And just because someone's symptomatic doesn't mean it's real progression and not pseudoprogression. We might be just as successful if we continued the treatment as well. But I think many of us are... Um, uh, gun shy about that, so to speak, uh, not wanting to uh, continue something that that um, we're worried isn't working. So uh, sometimes patients will uh, will have a lot of pressure um, from the uh, swelling around the tumor. Um, sometimes um, it's even. Uh, um, a, 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 sorry, a phenomenon that's a bit related to pseudoprogression, but is uh, more severe called radiation necrosis, where um, we will consider something called bevacizumab or Avastin. And I only mention this drug because of a phenomenon called pseudoresponse. Uh, um, this drug is also used at recurrence in glioblastoma and uh, or at, at some point in the patient's life, they may get exposed to it. 
um, it can really help reduce the swelling around the tumor and help someone feel better in the short term. But the tumor, it, it has little to no effect on the tumor itself, uh, unfortunately. And so we will sometimes see, um, we call it pseudo response because you can see that this area here is much smaller than it was. Um, but we know that the underlying tumor itself is continuing to grow because when this drug stops working, um, the, uh, the extent of disease can be considerably more than what it was when we started. And so we have both kind of phenomenon at play here, pseudo response and pseudo progression at times that we have to, we have to try to sort through them. I'll just say that we've found this to be an interesting problem and have wanted to study it more. And so we have um, developed a research cluster here in Manitoba that has um, that has members from our neuro-oncology team, um, neuroradiology and medical physics, neurosurgery, um, and we have basic scientists and students um, and others as part of the collaboration. And um, we are looking at uh, we are looking at uh, questions around pseudoprogression. Um, we're hoping to develop collaborations outside of Manitoba and have some interest in other provinces. Um, but what we've done locally um, has been kind of from two directions. We have started to collect blood samples from newly diagnosed patients with glioblastoma and uh, carry that through. And so one of the questions we would like to answer with those um, is, uh, you know, if someone has pseudoprogression, is there a blood marker that suggests pseudoprogression um, or that suggests real progression? And could we use that to help with our clinical decision making? Um, and so that's one of the questions we hope to answer um, uh, using that, using that uh, process. The other is, um, let's see here, the other is, um, a biomarker study that, that's using that same blood, but also using the advanced MRI techniques that I was just talking about. So we're trying to um, uh, change the standard protocol here to include uh, those advanced imaging uh, techniques for a group of patients and, uh, and study whether uh, it gives more information um, study whether it's actually more efficient for the system because these scans take a little bit longer if you do them each time, but it may be faster than me calling a patient back for another hour long MRI, um, you know, and so we're asking that question. It may be better for patients if we can better answer their questions. Um, but the more discovery tech question that we want to ask is using machine learning for these uh, for these advanced MRIs because it's hard enough for a human to look at regular MRI and try to sort out whether the perfusion is in the same spot as that change and whether that also corresponds to a change in the molecular composition. So we want to ask uh, we want to ask our computer science colleagues if they can. Um, use even more of the backend MRI data to help answer that question. So that's um, what, uh, what we've recently been funded to look for. And that's really what I wanted to say today. I, I just wanted to again, thank you. I, I just to recap, um, we know that uh, radiation and chemotherapy can cause changes on MRI that mimic disease progression. And that that's really what we're talking about when we say pseudo progression. There is no good way for us to differentiate between the two, true progression or pseudo progression. The only way that we know of based on the literature and, and following patients is to repeat the MRI a few months later, which uh, is sometimes very hard to do um, and to tell people that we just have to wait um, and, and check again. We know that the uh, that pseudoprogression can impact treatment decisions and uh, clinical trial interpretation. And so I'm hopeful that if we can discover more about what this is and how to differentiate real progression from pseudoprogression, that, um, that we'll be more accurate um, as clinicians, we'll be more accurate as clinical trialists. 
in, in um, evaluating new therapies. And we obviously hope that this will be, have a positive impact for patients. So with that, I would be happy to take questions and say thank you again for uh, letting me speak to you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Peets. That was such an informative presentation, and thank you for explaining it in a way that uh, helps all of us to comprehend the topic. Uh, there's just a couple of top uh, questions that came up. Uh, one is, do you ever suggest anything other than the SOC? Standard of care? Um, yes. So, uh, you know, in terms of frontline therapy, um, I do. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think standard of care really is not the just team is olamide with radiation. I think standard of care uh, is a clinical trial that includes that, um, or it includes whatever the standard is at the time and in that place. And so um, when I suggest something above standard of care, I think uh, it should be done in a clinical trial so that we know whether it's beneficial or not, and we know um, for the next patient coming through, whether we should add that treatment or not. So uh, to me, um, I guess that may be considered above standard of care, but it really, in my mind, is what standard of care should be considered. Great, thank you. And the other question is, does temozolomide cross the brain-blood barrier, and if not, why is it used? Good question. Um, so it, it does cross the blood-brain barrier, um, and uh, it's... There are some drugs that cross better than it, actually. I, I had done a study on that uh, years ago, looking at comparing it to other chemotherapies. Um, and um, so it's actually not the one that penetrates the best, but it does definitely get into the brain tissue. Um, and I think that's part of why it works. Um, I think part of the challenge is that we, we do blame a lot of the resistance to chemotherapy on the blood-brain barrier, but I'm not always convinced that that's the case. Some drugs are just better at treating brain tumors than others. And as you can see, the, the, what you're seeing on MRI, the, the post-gadolinium changes and the flare changes, those are measurements of blood-brain barrier disruption. So um, very large molecules probably aren't getting in, but smaller ones will get in. And, you know, tenozolamide is just relatively small. Um, I think that's partly what helps it get in and perhaps even into those areas that aren't um, bright on, on uh, the gadolinium scans. They, they, uh, with even less blood brain barrier disruption, it can still get in there. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, th that was it for questions. Um, before we sign off, just once again, want to thank you for taking time of your busy schedule, Dr. Peets, for joining us today. Uh, as My a pleasure. reminder to everybody, the presentation is has been recorded and we'll upload it as soon as possible to the website. Um, and before I log off, I'm just going to switch myself back to being presenter, Dr. Peets, uh, so I can show okay. um, the audience something on our website. So as uh, we're just finishing up here, um, can you see my website here? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So just wanted to show everybody that this is the main page of Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, uh, braintumor.ca. Here, where it's highlighted uh, towards the bottom left-hand side, this is where the entire webinar series is for the year. And so when you click on that, it gives you a schedule for the year. And the next presentation will be on Wednesday, March 6th, with Dr. Kuzimano and his peer, Amy Baba. And that will be on understanding meningioma and the impact on a person's quality of life. So make sure that you register for that. As well, we wanted to show you that um, our brain tumor walks are now open. So you can register for a walk in your city. Uh, we have over 20 cities that are participating across the country. You can uh, check out all the cities here on our website and register. And if you are a healthcare professional online, we really encourage you to get a team together from your center and uh, support your patients and families that are going to be walking in your respective areas. And lastly, want to also mention the studentships that we have um, because the deadline is coming up on February 25th. So if anybody knows of a student uh, who is um, looking for research dollars, we are uh, have opened the application process uh, for the Brain Tumor Research Studentship. 
And this is um, uh, provides students funding for two summers, $10,000 over two years to young researchers, helping them to start their careers in the important field of brain tumor research. We're really trying to encourage young um, people to get involved in neuro-oncology and neuroscience um, research as well. So that's it for us. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, as I said, uh, watch out for the webinar online, and we look forward to having you online for future webinars as well. Have a great day, everybody, and stay warm.